Hey, it's Louis Max for Grind and Pivot. Part two, Nana Clario. Pretty funny, huh? Guy's classic. Anyway, uh, check out part three coming up. The final part three. Where Nutsy... Everyone knows Nutsy. Everyone knows Naclario. And a special Nutsy rap. Peace. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. Let's talk about some of the characters over the years in City Hoops. I have, uh, you know, I know a couple. I want to hear you hear it. I want to hear your your take on some of your favorite characters, whether they be coaches, um, you know, agents, street guys, just anybody you, you that's on the tip of your tongue that you might be able to uh, engage us with, because I know there's probably some great stories. Well, there was a guy named Arnie Herskowitz. Okay, hold on, hold on. The fact that that's that if you didn't say him first, then there's no other intro. That is what that's why I want. Go ahead. Give it to me. Hearst was a guy. That. I met my third year. He sees me coach. I must have been 23, 24. He goes, Ron, you got a chance to be a great. I don't know who the guy was. He looked right. like Hold on a second. Hold on. Set this up. Because you know, who, you know who told me? I'll tell you. Honestly, I'll tell you. Uh, full disclosure, you know, Greg Barry, G-Man coach. Yeah, yeah. He gave me this question and he said to me, if he doesn't say Hirsch first, you know, uh, you got to come. Don't you'll come out with it. And I'm so happy you did because I had it written down. I'm waiting for you. So set up, set up Hirsch because you're right. Top of the line character. Well, uh, Hirsch, Hirsch. Starts, you're the great guy. So next thing you know, he, he, he asked me, I don't know. But next thing he goes, hey, Ron, can you work with this kid? From our, so I start working. And next thing you know, they're here. Then all of a sudden, he starts, you know, inviting me to games, Nick games, college games. Ron, let's go take a trip to, oh, I remember we went to see Pete Maravich. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. We went to see Lloyd Daniels playing his CBA. You know, we just, he was, it seemed like every kid in New York that I didn't know he knew when he was tight with. And whether it be Mark Jackson, Kenny Smith, Lloyd Daniels, on and on and on. In fact, when he got married, he went to Dayton. He got married at University of Dayton during graduate school. At the last second, the priest asked him, you got to have the best man. And a kid he sent out there from Westinghouse who almost got to the Final Four. Yo, Roosevelt was his best man, Roosevelt Chapman. <laughs> a lot of guys didn't know him when he almost beat Georgetown in, in the game to get to the Final Four. But he was a guy, he was a character. And from that, you know, he, he would be in every tournament. He, he, he put teams in a rucker, Dean Street. He put teams out in Rockville Center on Long Island. And, you know, you know he, he managed to make money. He knew a lot of people. And, uh, what was it, what was it some, about him? Oh, he, he was nuts. He, he was nuts in a good way, though, but he was nuts. I mean, he was nuts. Like, we're playing at Lafayette Gardens, and Keith Stroud, whose son, Keith was a very good player at Westinghouse with Gerald Green from Seton Hall, and we're playing, and Keith was a little, not nutty, but a little mouthy off then. And the ref wasn't calling the foul, or, you know, the, 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 the play that he was, good, was guarding him, was very aggressive. So he kept on going to Hirsch. Yo, Hirsch, if this guy doesn't stop shoving me, I'm going to hit the mother. I'm going to hit the mother. You know, I'm going to hit the mother. So this goes on the whole first quarter, second quarter. First play of the third quarter, the guy gets physical with Stroud again. Stroud goes up, gets the shot blocked, goes out of bounds. Stroud thinks it should be a foul like every kid thinks it does. And so he turns to Hirsch again. Yo, Hirsch, he does that. Again, I'm going to hit him. So Hirsch just comes out in the court and says, listen, hit the guy already so the game can go on. That would be the type <laughs> of guy Hirsch was. You know, another story, Ray Ralston's in eighth grade. Well, uh, oh, we go back. We've got to go back. Uh, <laughs> but, but playing at the Rucker, EDC, at the Tennis Basketball Classic. Classic. This was before there were all the barricades that prevented you from getting on the court. Right, it was all <laughs> open, right. Yeah, then the court was, you know, just please stay back. So, Hirsch, 
and I, we would just, I was playing. We would put a team in the rucker because Greg Marys, who ran the EPC, was a classmate of mine. And he says, Ron, put a team in the rucker. So, you know, Hurst did it. You know, he had Entourage or Albie's Trimmings or, or uh, Stan Dennis' place. I forgot what it was on 5th Street and 2nd Avenue. And, you know, they would sponsor the team. And, you know, it's a big game. We're, we're doing well. We're a high school team playing against college and pro guys, unlimited guys, and we made the playoffs. So now this game is packed. Packed. You can't. So there's a timeout. Hurst calls a timeout. Ron diagrams something. So the guys get off the bench to see what we're diagramming. Timeout's over. And all of a sudden, there's no room on the bench. Hurst sees these two little kids. Tells them, listen, you, know, you got you to try to get off the bench. You guys got to sit there. So they said they, they, they didn't do anything. We're little kids. One was 11, one was 12. <laughs> so I go, Hirsch, you know who those two kids are? He goes, you know them? I said, yeah. They're the two best guard, young guards in New York City. He goes, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah. That's 11 years old Stefan Marbury. That's 12-year-old Ray Ferrell. Wow. <laughs> so the next thing was Ray Ferrell shows up. Our next game, throws him a uniform. The uniform was too big for him. Hurst, see, Hurst played, Hurst didn't care. He played everybody. He didn't care. You know, he didn't care who you were. You got it. I played. There were games I was playing 20, 25 minutes. So Hurst puts the kid in. Uniform is too big. He gets the ball, full court. You know, of course, the guys want to steal the ball from him, take it. You know, he looked, he was 12 years old. Look, old midget. So, Rayford does some sort of between a leg, you know, goes by one guy like, what? Spins on the second guy, double spins on the third guy, between his legs, in his out the fourth guy, the fifth guy, he's about to, to shoot a shot. The guy sends the shot into the, into, the, into the crowd, but it was like, wait a second. We just saw, like, some Harlem Globetrotter stuff, like, whoa. And the guy in the mic called him shorty. So, it ends up, by the time Rafer was 14, 15 years old, he's playing with us, growing, getting better. Uh, we, I get the ball in a, in a game. Now, here we are fighting for a playoff spot. We got high school kids. Right. You know, Codlin Reeves. Ben Davis, the, the All-American from Oak Hill, somehow hears about us. And in wherever he grew up, the KKK went after him. And one of his roommates was, I forgot who it was that knew us. Somehow he comes up one weekend and plays with Ernie Lodge. And he stays with Hirsch the whole, the next three or four summers. This is Ben Davis, who played for Kansas. Great kid. And he's not a kid anymore. He's got to be 45, 50 years old, maybe even older. Right. But, uh. It ends up, we're playing. I pass the ball into Rafer, and I know Rafer's getting trapped in the right. This was the, the court closest to Frederick Douglass. So I realize, as a coach, you know, try to cut through the middle so Rafer's going to hit me to pass, make it easier to see, and, you know, get out of the trap. I end up stumbling, and there was a chunky referee after I stumbled that blocks my view. And all of a sudden, the crowd, which was packed, is roaring. Rafa, who was trapped with three guys, next thing you know, is out of the trap, beating him, looking at him, starts bouncing the ball high, and starts skipping. Skipping up the court while they're trying to chase him. Almost like making fun of him, like, you know, see if he can take right, me. Right. And Duke Tango, the famous announcer, starts going, skip, skip, skip to my loo, skip, skip, skip to my loo. And that was the beginning of Skip to My Loop. Wow. Great story. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah, Hirsch was definitely a real character. I don't know if oh, there's anybody else that could even follow him. Well, you know what? The people that know Hirsch, he was not illegal. He was not selling players to schools. He did a lot for a lot of kids like Todd Miles, the coach of Robeson. Yes. He, he got Todd to learn about a 401k 
put some money that he made because Todd, Todd got into an accident. He made a couple hundred thousand, and he explained, Hearst explained to him. So they're, they're all indebted to Greg Lawrence Pollard, the Jefferson coach. Yep. When he got into a car accident with Wilfred Cacaldi, Hearst drove right down there like he was the father. Uh, when the rent the car tried to get him to sign, you know, nothing. He got him not to sign, got him a lawyer. He got them some money, told them how to invest it. So, you know, Hirsch is a guy said to a lot of people that never thought there was a guy. Yeah. How about Chuck? Oh, Chuck Vance. He was with me. Chuck's a legend. Yeah. C classic, Chuck, right? Chuck, yeah. Ch Chuck was with my assistant coach, like 97, 98, 99. You know, and then, you know, he, 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 he he's beaten cancer. I wish I had as many city championships as he's beaten cancer. And then it got to the point he had to step away for a couple of years. And then in those years, you know, he would come to a game or two. Uh, you know, we added a couple of assistants. And yeah, didn't he come back? actually was the dean of students at Cardoza, Carolyn DeVore. And when he came back, he actually came back close to his house at Springfield Gardens. Right. Tough he, guy, right? He walks around with his, he's amazing. Like, he would walk around Cardoza. Kids he didn't even know. Chinese kids, black kids, Asian kids, white kids. He didn't know they were late to class. He's walking them out around the room, smacking them. Get the class, get the exactly. class. Like, exactly. Exactly. He didn't even know who he was. <laughs> I know. But his heart, his heart is in the right place. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Absolutely. So, College coaching, you, uh, you had a couple of shots. You want to talk about it a little bit? Um, is it is there was there a time when you had a chance to go and you didn't? Was there a time when uh, you had a chance it didn't come through? You feel like talking about it? Well, you know what? I look back. You know, I was one of those guys. You know, I spoke what was on my mind because I believe. You know, you weren't gonna. You know, you weren't going to buy me. You weren't going to get me to sell players to schools. Uh, I never wanted to leave New York. I was in New York, and my dream job was St. John's. That was my dream job. I mean, you know, I, if it meant me waiting two, three years to be an assistant at St. John's or get the head job instead of getting to, I would do it, you know. Could I have gone other places if I pursued it? I'm sure. Uh, I remember, you know, I got to be, I got to know Jeff Van Gundy when he was at Rutgers and Stan Van Gundy was at Fordham because they would call me. I was doing the hoop scoop. You know, Ron, what do you think of this kid? What do you think of that kid? Who should we be looking at? And I have letters saying, you know, thank you. You know, we're going recruiting this kid. We're recruiting that kid. And so I got to know them. And I forgot the father's name. who was the great coach at the junior college upstate New York. And I got to know them, you know. And some next thing you know, Van Gundy's with the Knicks. Next thing you know, Jeff's with the Knicks. And, you know, I would see Jeff, I would talk to Jeff and tell him, you know, listen, you know, you got a break. Hopefully I can get a break. And the day that we beat Kennedy at the Garden, March, I mean, March 14th, 1999, uh, Van Gundy's at the game, actually he's rooting for us because the Knicks were playing that night. But Van Gundy's mind wasn't there because they were struggling. And if they would have lost, the word on the street was, if he lost that night, they were going to fire him. Right. Well, they won that night, and they, you know, won several more games, and the rest is history. Right. Uh, there was one or two college games. I think it was so. I would sit with Brendan Malone, his great assistant, who ended up leaving to go to with Chuck Daly with Detroit and won NBA championships. Who ended up going to Indiana? Whose son, Mike Malone, now is the head coach of the Denver Nuggets. And I remember them saying to me one day, he goes, Ron, you put so much into it. He goes, you, you getting tired of it? I said, I mean, I love it, but I'd love to get a break, you know, and right. hopefully you guys can give me a break. And I remember Jeff in 1999 saying, when I wrote him a letter, he called me, he goes, Ron, I don't have any openings, but if I ever get one, I would definitely love to interview. So now Brenda Malone leaves to go to Indiana. I try to get a hold of Jeff. I try to get, I can't get a hold of him. I can't get a hold of him. I, said, oh. I mean, hopefully what he said was sincere, but, 
And going through my my stuff in my house, I found I actually wrote Jeff Van Gundy a le- a, a poem. I can't find it now. I have a poem that I wrote him that I read that is awesome to try to, you know, show a different side of me that would give, get that phone call, Ron, come on up to purchase, we'll interview you. But it never happened. And you know what? I have letters to Dwyer and Scott. I have letters to, to, to Rod Dawn. I have letters to George Carl. I have, I mean, forget that. And what really kind of made me realize something I would write every two or three months for years, three, four, five years. I would write letters to Jim Dolan, to the really? GM. Who, I, have, I mean, uh, to the GM. I have letters. And about 10, I, I stopped. This was after like eight years of every month or two writing letters. You know, same letter, they went. So I'm on the, I'm on the subway. I don't remember who it was. It was a black guy. Hey, coach, how you doing? I don't know who he is. You know, I mean, I get that a lot. A lot of people know yeah, me. I don't know. Of course. So we start talking, and so he goes, Coach, why'd you stop sending letters? I go, What are you talking about? He goes, Yeah, yeah, you used to send all the letters to the guy. He goes, I go, Wait a second. I was like. How did this guy know what I just told you? I said, well, how do you know? He goes, coach, I'm in charge of the mail room at Madison Square Garden. Wow. You used to write all these letters. This guy, that guy. What happened? Interesting. What I'm getting so though, too, I, I just, is that. Um, I, I, I basically told him I got tired of, you know, t- being, being told no by not even getting a phone call. Yeah, but you said also before one thing that was telling, I think, uh, you know what? You really didn't want to leave New York. So you really didn't. I mean, that's kind of the answer because I think if you really had no qualms about leaving, whether it be family or your New Yorker, you could have gone pretty much anywhere. I mean, listen, I I mean, so many people have talked, we talked, you know, I know – the great high school coaches. I know all the college coaches. Are pro- when, with, when I'm with them, I feel I am. Like, I, I, I uh, there's so many great pro guys. And as a guy that was with the, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, but USA Youth Basketball asked me to do a clinic one time. And I forgot the guy's name. He was the assistant coach of the Celtics. And and the assistant coach at the Lakers, it's going to bother me not knowing his name. Oh, crud. He's a very, very bright coach. And I'm speaking on a Sunday. He's speaking on a Saturday. He's very, he's awesome. And when I walked over to introduce myself, he goes, Ron, how you doing? I was like, this guy knows me. <laughs> you know, like, like, then we start talking. He goes, yeah, he goes, coach, you're doing it. Like, I didn't realize, like, they all know me. You know, like, like, Royal... When he's with OKC, sitting on, he's sitting in practice one day, and I don't know, boy, he goes, he goes, well, I want to answer your question. He goes, yeah, he goes, how's the Clario doing? So I was like, you know the Clario? So Kevin Durant goes, he goes, come on, man, everybody knows the Clario. Right. <laughs> and I'm finding out right. Right. everybody does. You know, it's not an egotistical thing. It's not me patting my back. You know, I find out everybody knows me, you know, wherever I go. You know? Yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, as I, and that, you know what? That's a credit to me putting a million percent in making this procession job. You get paid, you know, two hours a day, you know, eight a day. Like, I laugh because I say this. And I love all of my players that have done well. You know, Dwayne Coswell had a mansion in Atlanta, a mansion in Sacramento, first round grand pick. You know, I'm glad he got it. Yeah, you're I genuinely say, happy for all of them, aren't you? Yeah, and, and Royal Ivy, God bless him. He's making five, six, seven hundred thousand a year in coaching. But I said this. This is amazing. Royal Ivy is going to make more as a coach this year in meal money. In meal money 
then I'm going to make it a whole year. Right. Because in the NBA, you get $139 a day on the road. Yeah. But it, at this point, though, you know, in life, it, you know, the bread is one thing, obviously, for the younger guys. But at this point in life, for you, you know, you're doing your thing. Yeah, you're 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 content doing what you think. I, I, are you getting tired of it? You, you're wearing, you're showing signs of wear because. Uh, you know what? I, I would say this: if I wasn't lucky enough to have Billy Medley, Mike Wissett, Harold Johnson, and Rob Moses with me, would it, I don't know if I can do it. Right. But you know what? My new verve, my new vigor, instead of trying to get a head coaching job with the Knicks or the Nets or St. John's. Because I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to coach college because I'm not recruiting. Yeah, I'm not, not now. Some, I'm not kissing some some crazy kid's ass, you know, talking to some handler that wants money. I'm not doing that. Right. You know. Right. But my new thing is this, and a lot of people have been calling me to teach the kids how to become better players, help the coaches, the young coaches become better players. I like that. Uh, what's going on in society today? Uh, a lot of people want me to help the city out. I've had some of the top cops, the commissioners, the chiefs, uh, want me to help them, you know, grab the youth of, of New York City. Uh, yesterday, I was on uh, a Zoom talk, and somehow, I mean, she knew who I was, but we never met before, never talked, but she wants me to help her. Help! It was Alveda King. Alveda King is the niece of Dr. King. Uh, the brother, her father was the younger brother, Martin King. She was, She's an unbel. If you Google Alveda King, she's 69 years old. She is unbelievable. She's an American activist. She tries to help all. She's big into God. She's wrote 23 books. I quickly looked at four or five of them. Amazing. And Yesterday, I was on a 45-minute Zoom with her and uh, Father Frank Perone, who's the president of the National Priest for Life, and I was honored that they want me to try to do that. So maybe my calling, besides coaching Cardozo, is to, is to help the youth, to help the youth coaches, you know, and yeah. I have a way with the kids, whether they're black, white, Chinese, Puerto Rican, I can say stuff. And I don't mean to get away with it, but, you know, I'm me. You know, like, I, I know. Listen, I've seen it. I I've seen it during life, you know? during the I mean, hundred timeouts you take in a scrimmage. Of hey, course. Man, listen, they got to learn. Scrimmage, scrimmages are learning situations. <laughs> I love it. You know, like here, when I get my kids and I'll tell them the rules and I'll tell them this and I'll tell them, you know, I'm in charge. You're going to do it my way, the highway. No, the best thing is, I remember, I mean, many times, the best thing during a scrimmage, I think I was coaching with Ben at Forest Hills. You know, you called one of the many timeouts. You could, you know, you come onto the court, you're explaining to the kid, and the fa he's just looking at you, you know, like, well, you got you to gotta be kidding. But you know what? They do hear you. I, I think it's a good segue. I think the next chapter for your life might be this. You're right. Helping no, the kids. No, I mean, listen, what am I going to do? I mean, I'm going to start calling up kids. First of all, you know, to be an assistant, maybe in the NBA like Pete Carroll did, because I got to know Pete Carroll well. You know, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, maybe for a year or two, I, like Mike Blissett, my assistant, he says, Ron, I don't want you leaving, because if you ever left, that's the end of me. I'm not coaching. Right. Cardoso. But he goes, you deserve it. You know, and I tell Mike, but you know what? Royal Ivy did say, and his father did say, if he ever gets a head job in the NBA, he's going to take me. You know, and, and I know the NBA is a different game. You got to talk to him differently, and you can't be like Coach DeClario. You'll be an school. advisor. Yeah, you know, but like, like I would tell these guys, I said, fellas, if you really love it, and, and I got to get you in a nice way to work harder, to follow the rules. Instead of getting on you like, you know, a berating Bobby tonight so that you can get better. So that you, if you get better, you're only going to get millions more. If you get better and you do it consistently for years, you're going to get millions more, times millions more. So, like, cut it out. But, you know, what? a lot of these kids have been pampered for so long. 
and they don't realize it. You know, like, you know, yeah, I made 30 million. Well, you know what? If you weren't such a knucklehead and you worked harder and you worked on your deficiencies and you were more coachable, the 30 million could have been 92 million. <laughs> exactly. So how, so how have the kids changed present day to, you know, from the last 10, 15 years? How, how, how do you think the kids have changed and, and how have the parents changed as well? Well, the kids, unfortunately, they all think they're D1. Correct. They don't realize how hard it is to go D1. In Queens, this year, you can't even count. You can't even count because of the insanity with the pandemic and the season ending early. But uh, in the last two years, minus that, in Queens, public school athletically, all of Queens, double A, A, and B, there have only been six kids to go D1 or D2. In the whole borough. Exactly. I don't want to hear you didn't have the grades. I don't want to hear you got, I don't want to hear. There have been six kids in the whole borough for the last two years. All six are Cardozo kids. All six are Cardozo kids. One of them, I had, had only one scholarship, and how he got it, I had to call the president of Niagara University. Right. And he kind of told the, the head coach at the time, yo, take a chance on the kid. The Clario believes in him. So and how do you kid, account for it? What? How do you account for the change? What do you think the change is? Well, one, everybody lives off of one shake and bake move, one three on in a, you know on a, on an Instagram, a Twitter, Facebook. Correct. There is no. I'm gonna bust my behind today, to hopefully down the road. Just, they all want it to now instant gratification, and then the parents get shot. The parents are shot. Most parents don't value education for their kid. You know, so many coaches, even Bob Hurley at the end. Bob Hurley. You play for the great Bob Hurley. He was getting parents complaining, why is my kid not playing more? Why is my kid not taking more shots? So Hurley told me this. I said, wait a second. If Hurley's getting it, you know, you know I'm getting it and everybody else. Right. But the sad thing is this. The parents who bitch and complain about the coach, the coach is your, yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, like anything. Just like there's some bad cops, you know, yeah, I'm sure there's some bad coaches. But I wonder if those parents that were bitching to the coach, you're jerking my son, he should be starting. You're jerking my son, he should be shooting more. You're jerking my son, he should be playing more. Are you doing the same thing? To him, when he gets an 80 or a 65 in a social studies class, or man, are you getting on his teachers the same way you're getting on his coaches? You know right. they're not. It's all basketball. They're, like, they're caught up in this insanity. Right. Well, how you about know? the game they're watching as well? I mean, the game's changed, right? Say that again? The game of basketball has changed. You know, the oh, game. When, I, when I first started coaching? There was no three-point shot. There was right. no shot. I mean, of course. I mean, we grew up learning how to pay. You know, you see a game now from back in the day, and you see passing, you see good passing, you see real defense. Yeah, you know, in these kids, they think this is the play we put in, the one-on-five offense. Right. You know, on the second play is, I pass out of necessity. Like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> he cut it out, man. Right. You know? Right. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, young coaches – you know, they want to win at what cost they have. To, I have to try. I would love to teach them how to win. And you know what? Just like I got mesmerized by talent, character is important because you know what? The problem basketball player. Tell me a problem basketball player, a Chris Washburn, a Joe Hammond, a Pee Wee Kirkland. Tell me one of those that have made it or, or that you gave the chance and helped you win. They don't help you win. You can't, you can't win with cancer. Well, yeah. I mean, listen, good friend, Timmy Clouse, you know him very well, right? Who? He always says you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Yeah. Who said that again? Timmy Clouse. Oh yeah. 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 Tim, Timmy texted me twice. I mean, I, I don't know what happened with him. I wish he was still coaching. I heard it was a medical thing, but yeah, he I hope he's me. feeling better. I, it, it was a medical I thing, I believe, but Shout out to Tim Clouse. I hope you're feeling Tim, better, Tim Coach. Tim Clouse texts me. He goes, Gron, he goes, I need your schedule. I'm coming by your games. I'm like, what? If you come up by my games, get in your gym and do your thing. But you know what? 
for Tim, it ended. I'm glad for him. He made some money. He never sold his principles out in high school. He never sold his principles out. He took Iona to a place. Yeah, good good basketball coach, by the way. Oh, very good. Very Real good, solid. Very good. Yeah, and you know what? He's a little rough around the edges, but all the good ones are, you know? No doubt about it. You can't it. give in to the insanity. So what's, so what's the real Ron DeClario like? You into music, food, aside from I mean, basketball? Yeah, like tell, music, tell me, you know, tell me music. I eat, I eat every day. You know, I love my beer. You know, I'm drinking a natural life right now. How about music? You know, I mean, you know, I like the good music. You know, good what do you like? Tell, good, what, what, what would good. surprise somebody out there if, if, if they asked? Well, how about this? I'm going to give a little rap. Right? You know about rap? Go ahead. You know, a, this is the first time I'm doing this, so I might appear a little nervous. You all know me from coaching. I'm putting over 40 years of service. You look at me and you see I'm a middle-aged honky, but don't try to play me like I'm a full-fledged donkey. Try to set the youth on the right level of words of persuasion. So many times it falls on deaf ears. It's a system of Caucasian. Mad respect because I taught so many it's a question of who's who. So doing my thing with passion. The hood knows how Skip got his loom. A ball, a hoop, hard work, and a dream. When I push them, I'll get in their face. Can they handle when I scream? Wrong color in the right game. Made no money. That's a damn shame. I earn so very little cheese. I got a dime dollar menu, Mickey D. Everyone loves a player in the court who hustles and dies. I wanted to coach basketball. I ended up coaching live. People see me coach. They say I'm bold. I'm hyper. They say I'm totally crazy. 20 years ago I did this. I would have been Jay-Z. Wow. Dope, as they say, coach. Dope. Yeah, best, best. I am a dope. Four letter word. I love it, baby. I love it. Best pizza in Queens. <laughs> I mean, you know, I went to Gabby's in Francis Lewis. That's awesome. I heard about this Marzella, but then there's Geno's near Springfield. So those are the three places I know. But like, that's like saying, who's better? You know, uh, you know, you're on the dream team. Who's better? You know, unless you're Michael no v- Jordan. No VI pizza on Bell? Oh, that's the, but the VIP. But that's Sicilian. But that's Sicilian. Okay, good. Yeah, All right. Said, okay. What's the best Sicilian? That's it. All right. Best Sicilian VIP. Yeah, yeah. Best yeah. regular. You're going to go with what? Gabby's is really good. Gino's is good. I've never been to a place called Marabella or Marabella. Amore. Amore. I, you know, listen. Listen, I, I don't want to disrespect any pizza parlor that makes this place, but you know what? <laughs> I you know, love you, I man. I, I, I really, really do. Listen, as you get older, you realize you can't. There were a lot of battles you thought were worth fighting. Don't even fight. You know, and just keep on moving on. You know? I like it. You can't well, make, I- like you said, you can't make chicken soup out of chicken crap. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so, so much. You have any plugs you want to shout out? Anything you want to talk about? Anything that's coming up? Well, any, any, well, I'm going to try to get out there because I heard the the rims are coming back up uh, this Friday. And I don't know when you're going to add this for this Friday, July 10th. They're finally going to do the thing at the Baisley Houses in front of the rec center for the kid that got shot and killed, Amir Griffin. Uh, finally turned 15 years old. That That's going to bother me for years. You know, for, I forget what it's doing to the parents. But, uh, Every day on Facebook, Ron Naclario, Twitter, at Coach R. Naclario, and on Instagram, Ron Naclario, all lowercase, I put up some funny things, some coaching tidbits, some, some thought provocative quotes, some funny stuff. Yeah, I love the uh, advice. I love your advice. Yeah, yeah, and people, you know, would follow me. I mean, I look at some of these people that have 100, 200, 500,000 followers. You know, I don't have, I have a couple thousand on one or 5,000 on this. And, and like, I'm wondering, like, and I watch your day, it's just be, are they the name? So, you know, I would hope that they, you know, look at it. If they like it, follow it or tweet it or Instagram it or Facebook it and tell their friends. Absolutely. Well, my man, I want, I really want to thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, you told me, you told me 45 minutes. You had me off for almost two hours. Of course, that's the only way to do it, you know? I got to get a lot of stuff, and then I got to cut it down. But I think this is going to be a great one. And uh, I'm hoping everything recorded. If it didn't, I'm going to have to call you back. We'll have to do it again. uh, uh, If it didn't record and we did this all for nothing, 
Then I got two words for you, and then not happy birthday. <laughs> I love you, man. Feel I'll good. Speak to you soon. Best of luck. I'll speak to you soon. Bye bye. Peace. Thanks so much for listening. Big shout outs to the crew behind the scenes. John Hart, Ian Lidovich, Russ McMahon, and of course my wife Jill. Don't forget to smash that like button, comment and subscribe, and follow at Grind and Pivot. You already know, we appreciate you. Later, son.